I am Bill Clinton's son. It was common knowledge. Everyone in Arkansas knew. Everywhere I went, they pointed, this Bill Clinton's son right there. He looked like him, don't he? The ears, the mouth, the chin, the teeth, the eyes, the nose. I see him in me. You can see a black Bill Clinton. When I brush my hair, I, I can see Bill Clinton with waves in his head. <laughs> I always felt bad about him not wanting to be in my life. Was it because I was black? Was it something wrong with me? Why he don't want to be a part of me? It made me think of even sometimes suicide. It's not fair, and it has been hurtful. That he still refused to acknowledge me. Well, time was very hard, and my mom was a working girl on the streets. She was heavy on drugs. I was told that she was with him on 13 occasions. My mom went to prison and lost custody of us. My Aunt Lucille stepped up and gained guardianship of us. She raised us in Little Rock, Arkansas. At the time, we was from group home to house to house. My Aunt Lucille wanted to have a father in my life. As a small child, she took me to the governor mansion. There was a car coming at the front gate, right? And the gate swings open. <laughs> I ran up in there and ran behind the gate, okay? She was trying to get him to accept me and notice me. When I got to the door, I asked her, and the door slammed in my face. It slammed the door in her face. This is Bill's son. He had the black son out here. <laughs> Hillary, she had guys chase him off the property. And I went to run and jump the thing. the hell out of there. I read history. It basically goes back to slave owners. When they have a child with one of their slaves and the wife try to have them banished off the plantation. What century is this? It just wasn't right. Every child in this state is somebody because we're going to give them every chance we can. And honestly, we were needing child support at the time. My mom was in prison. We was poor, okay? We had nothing. Who going to listen to us? Really? My industry was working at a gas station. We had no money to pay lawyers. And just shut us up. My mom told me on a few occasions when she was straightened. She didn't talk to me and my mom we don't come up missing. She was also pushed out a two-story window where she got a metal plate in her foot. To this day, she still feels scared of speaking. And they try to get information about the baby's voice and they can give her, you know, I guess the first one. In fact, my mother did receive seven one hundred dollars bills a month in the mailbox. Even presents on Christmas that was delivered to my home by state troopers. So I felt he was trying to be a part of my life. And then when he became president, everything stopped. In 1995, when my father was president of the United States, the state of Arkansas put us in foster care. I lived in foster homes it made me feel horrible because I know his child, Chelsea, was well taken care of. And we was house to house, hungry at nights. And to know that my father was the president, it hurts. Try to imagine that your own father refused to love you. Refused to say that you exist. Knowing who my father was and that he was so close yet so far away. I made my pain unbearable. Growing up in Little Rock School District System, it was difficult because you got gang members, drug activities at the schools. And I wanted more to life. I didn't want to end up dead in the streets for nothing. Moving from home to home, not having a stable place to go. It came to a point in high school where I had to drop out to take care of my little sisters and brothers and make sure they were stable and able to go to school every day. I got a job full time at a donor shop my 11th grade year to support my sisters and brothers. If I had the love and support of my father that stayed on me 
make sure I had the best education, I felt I would have had a better life. In 1999, they tried to sweep me under the rug with Bill Clinton's friend publishing this phony DNA test. It never was a DNA test. Roger Altman. Roger is a longtime friend of mine. Just think about it. It was published in a tabloid owned by a donor of Bill Clinton. Even to this day, Megyn Kelly, Howard Kirk, they continue to quote this bogus DNA test, and it really hurts. I would love to see the DNA test done. Several times, I tried to reach out to the Clintons. People say all the time, you're going to get yourself killed dealing with the Clintons. I wrote letters to his library. I wrote letters to addresses I got off the internet. Even emailed them from Facebook on his Facebook pages. I never got any response back. Once in Little Rock, Arkansas, I visited the Clinton Library. I wanted to see how it felt to be in his presence, and he was speaking. But by the time we made it there, it was he was already gone. We took a tour through the library, and just to see all the things he'd done in the world, helping other kids in Haiti and, you know, all the other places, it's, it just saddened me because I never received any help from him. Hillary started running for president. She visited Little Rock at one of her campaign stops. I put myself right in front of the podium where she spoke. She was looking right at me. I contact. In my heart, I was thinking she knew who I was. I met with a small group of the Black Lives Matter activists. It made me wonder if she says Black Lives Matter, why I don't matter to her. And I just felt for them. I was going to introduce myself as Danny Williams, her husband's son, and her stepson. You know, I am a new grandmother, in case you haven't heard. I had millions of questions to ask, you know, why? We're going to do everything we can to make sure she has every opportunity. As soon as she spoke, she got out of there. I didn't get to talk to my stepmom. I could never imagine having a child not acknowledge him. I thought, I know how it feels to not have a parent in your life. I work construction. I am a person of faith. I take my kids to church every Sunday. I teach my sons how to keep bad language out your mouth, how to speak properly with yes, sir, and yes, ma'am. Recently, I've been telling my kids that their grandfather was the president of the United States. And they're amazed by it. They're like, no, you know, is it for real? And I tell them, yes, you know, that is my father. And I'm going to make sure you get to meet him one day. Hillary, please do not deny I exist. I am your stepson. Chelsea is my sister. And Bill is my father. Super predators. We have to bring them to heal. I felt bad when Hillary called black people super predators and that we need to be brought to heal. I'm black, I'm real, I am her stepson, and I deserve the love that she has given Chelsea. We hear my stepmother tells the nation every day we're stronger together. They know who I am, and I know who I am. I have to meet my father. I have to know that he's willing to, to even accept me. I have to know that he... I mean, I don't know. Like any child, I want to know my dad and I want him to know me. I'm his only son in the world and he's my only dad. We have to come together. We have to. If black lives truly matter to you, please contact me.
just me. Well, you know, brother, first you have to know who you are. Okay. And until you know who you are, you can't talk about leadership. You know, you used a phrase a few minutes ago, African-American. Let me give you the true history. When Hannibal crossed the, the mountains and went into what's now known as Italy, he took 30,000 soldiers from Carthage. Yes, sir. And he took those soldiers there and he conquered all of Italy. Yes, sir. Sicily, all of that. And when he conquered them, you know what he did? He kept them there for over 30, to over 20. Yeah. And Hannibal, rather than allow them to kill him, he committed suicide. Yes, he did. Yes, and he did. the man who did that, his name was Scipius Africanus. Mm -hmm. And then he went on to Carthage, and then they named a continent that was known as e Eden. And uh, prior to that, it was known as Kemet. All right? And then what they did was they turned around after they did all of that and named the whole Canada continent after a Caucasian. And people, I don't call myself an African because I'm not. Okay. All right? I'm a Moorish Israelite. That's right. Yes, sir. I greet you in the words of Assalamu alaikum, which means peace and blessings be upon you. And um, hey, I got to mention both Jesus and Muhammad's names. Peace be upon them both of you. Looking at the Underground Railroad, we come on every Saturday night at 10.30 p.m. So after you get through looking at Fox and CNN and ABC, they news, get the real news on Underground Railroad television show at 10.30. And you know what? Um, it's hot to the people that are looking over, looking at this in Chicago and in cyberspace. ED, I may be saying it wrong. I want to ask you something. Sure. Why is it? Why? Why is it that when an average citizen dies, there's no remorse, but when a police officer, a law enforcement person gets killed, we have seen the mayor cry on television and we have seen the superintendent of the police department cry a well on television but when the average citizen gets killed they don't show the same love but if a police gets killed they're going to spend all their resources to why why and we pay them we pay them you mean why be why why is it they cry and they wail and say we're gonna find him which i'm not talking about police officers yeah. but why don't they give that same urgency and care to us the average citizen when they get our tax pay, taxpayers money i'm asking <laughs> well first of all you, you kind of have to understand something about the uh, the origin and the history of the police department in and of itself First of all, um, if you look at the police department as a whole, especially now in, in this country and across the country, and whatnot, you'll mm -hmm. find that there's, some, there's a lot of good cops, but there's also a lot of very bad cops, okay? A lot of bad. When I say bad, I mean, I don't mean that they're just evil, mean-spirited, malicious people, but there are a lot of cops who just have bad intentions, who have bad viewpoints, and people who have been misinformed and and program and indoctrinated to kind of see certain people. I want to follow up with something. In a certain light. So now, when you start talking about uh, tragedies that befall cops in this city or in this state or whatnot, and I think that it is, it is incumbent upon other cops to show that particular kind of concern or emotion about it because they're all in the same club, so to speak. So, I mean, that, that could easily have been one of them. So had they not shown any kind of a 
emotional uh, concern uh, along those lines, wouldn't it? They realized that the same thing could have happened to them, and they wouldn't have wanted anybody to take a uh, solid or uh, unemotional. Oh, they show the same love towards Aperture. I'm saying because we're paying them, man. Are we living in a police state? Would you say? <laughs> yes, we are. You would say, yeah. Almost. You know, that's a very dangerous statement to make. It's all right. You I know, know about the Patriots Act. Yeah, but do you know how? Now he's doing it. Go ahead. <laughs> well, do you know how the police police got started in the first place? The, the slave, what happened is the slaves got away and you know, they said we're going to yes. make a paddy wagon and we're going to catch them. Yeah, absolutely. But, they, but were you said, paddy, they were called paddy rollers okay. in the beginning. And there was a reason why they were called paddy rollers. These were these the people that were sent out to, who enjoyed going out to capture the uh, absconding or, or runaway slaves and whatnot. This, that, and the other. Runaway African slaves, I would like to put. And uh, they enjoyed that. And for some reason, they had a tendency to, uh, to hire a lot of Irish people. You know, Irish were just coming over, immigrating over to this country from Europe. Mayor and, Daly. And they were kind of looked down upon, so to speak. They were looked upon as being the white niggas of Europe, so to speak, the Irish were. So when they came here, they caught hell. And, but somehow or another, uh, as they began to rise up the ladder socially, economically, and whatnot, they were allowed to be put in charge of the policing departments and areas. They started out as slave catchers and this and the other. And if you look around the city, most of your cops uh, seem to be of an Irish ethnic background. And a lot of them bring to the table a lot of their biases, their, their, their traditional biases that they've had all along from the people of color. And I asked you something, but you, had, you, made, you made a profound statement. You said that they're good cops. Let me ask you a question. If you are a good cop, how is it? Do you, would you classify this as good if you knew that your partner was collecting money from a drug house and you didn't say anything about it? That's corruption. There is a code of silence on the police department. So is, it, is, a, is an officer good if he subjects himself and submits to the code of silence? Is he good? Well, uh, it's, to ask you. What I, I'm saying code of silence means is. The blue code. It, the blue code. Blue code of, yeah. If I know he's doing something and I don't say anything, to me, you're just as evil. I can tell you where drug houses operating there right now. And the policemen, are they good? Well, I, I, I don't, first of all, that becomes a, a, a manner or a question of ethics. Okay. Depends on what kind of ethics you have. But when I say good cops, I basically uh, am referring to those people who just see it as a job, as a means to an end. And they, they I mean, you, you know, for some reason, it's easier to get a, 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 a job or employment uh, in this society uh, as on, on that particular side of the, the field more so than anywhere else. I mean, you can be a security guard cops. Uh, they even let ex-convicts and everybody. Anybody can become. Are they good? Uh, uh, well, <laughs> like I said, like I said before, uh, it, it becomes a, a matter of ethics. And with the, the ones that I consider good are the ones who just see it as being a job. Now, the ones who take this particular position and they manipulate and they use it for their own purposes to express their own means, their own feelings, uh, biased feelings toward people and whatnot. That's a whole nother animal, brother. And there are a lot of them that do that. You know, okay. and some people just see it as a job. They they they, they, they approach it and they deal with it as simply being a means to an end, a means of, uh, uh, of uh, income and employment for themselves and their family. And those are the ones that I feel like are good cops and they're well-meaning. I, I would say that there's very few. I, I'm, I'm, and, I'm in agreement. With and you. I, I would say the one, first of all, I'm acting like I'm doing an interview. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but you know what? I would say the majority of them they work inside the priest. Not the ones what? inside of the police precinct department, it's but the indoors. Yes, oh, you, oh, no, the higher ups, the yes. hierarchy, and the lower ranks. Yeah, well, the lower ranks are not shot callers. You know what I'm saying? They're not shot callers at all. They basically are people who have been trained, almost like a robotic automatrons, to see things a certain way and give a certain reaction. And if something happens that's not within that area of which they've been robotically trained to deal with their encounter, they don't know what to do. Okay. Like encountering someone who knows okay. the law. I mean, you know? Man, you know, you know, as we talk about that, man, there are unsolved murders that are going on in Chicago, and I would like for you to explain to me in, in the audience, how in the hell is it that Emmanuel's, Mayor Emanuel's son or daughter could get killed, or Obama's son, I mean, daughter could get killed, a Lightfoot, Mayor Lightfoot, daughter could get killed and they will find the person 
They would use all their resources. But the average citizen, there's so many damn unsolved murders, they wouldn't get the same urgency. Why? Why? That's, that's not right, brother. Well, I think, <laughs> I think that you kind of just answered your own question. You said they will use all of their resources. Yeah. That's, that, that's, that's basically uh, it in a nutshell. The fact that when one of their own, especially uh, a high profile member of their particular order is assaulted or offended in that particular order. They go all out about it. And, and, and I'm not saying that, that that's fair. They should go all out about any particular murder of anybody for that matter. But when it's one of them, all of a sudden it takes on an entirely different new magnitude. And, uh, but when you talk about murders, uh, I think that more uh, outstanding than all of that is the fact that you have all of these uh, murders that have been occurring uh, uh, to, with, with us as black people, especially our women and kids across this country, oh, by the yeah. thousands. I mean, our, our people have been coming up. Nobody seems to want to address the issue of the missing uh, children, the missing girls and women, the, uh, and, and the missing people, black people who have been coming up missing uh, in this country, all across the country for that matter. They've been coming up missing them when some of their bodies are found, their organs are, are displaced and taken out. They've been, dis mm -hmm. they've been disemboweled and whatnot. Mm -hmm. You don't hear anybody really addressing that. And I think that they should declare a state of emergency. Uh, I think that it's at the point where it should be declared a state of emergency in terms of, of the, uh, the, the amount of uh, incidents, instances where we're being murdered and we're found but, murdered and, and disappearing. Let me digress. I want to ask you why is the urgency when it comes to Mayor Lightfoot's daughter and Obama's daughter and May, May, ex-Mayor Manuel's son or daughter. And they say the hell with the people that live on the low end of 79th Street, 87th Street. I'm talking about Chicago. I'm not, well, why, why? I, I, don't, I don't believe that they're saying to hell with them. I just don't believe that they're putting as much energy and resources uh, What's the into difference? it. Well, again, we're talking about the people who are of the, on the higher rungs of the ladder uh, having uh, experience or, or been impacted by certain things that affect the everyday person. And they go all out. Is it right? Absolutely not. <laughs> Absolutely not. I think that they should put the same amount of effort uh, into uh, investigating and uh, bringing uh, to, to justice the same pe perpetrators as much as they would anybody else. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Unsolved murders. And do, do you have a warning? There are young ladies that are going outside at night and they're starting to hop happen in the broad day. The way they are being abducted and you know what, and they're finding these bodies and there's no organs in them. Absolutely. What is your feel? There's hearts missing, there's lungs missing. Why? What's going on, man? Well, first of all, it's not, <laughs> first of all, it's not being publicized. And when we talk about these things, we, we almost talk about it in whispers. You see, you know, we as black people, we have a habit of not wanting to be truthful about real issues for fear of offending the dominant culture or offending the powers that be. We, we're, 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 we're in such a state and we've always been in such a state where we don't have, we're not at liberty to speak the peace, speak the truth about how we feel about certain issues. Now, the, uh, all of the people that are coming up missing and found disemboweled and their organs and the internal parts and everything like that taken out of them and whatnot, we know that this is happening. But what I'd like to know is that why are they not publishing or, or at least publicizing uh, the racial aspect of how many of these people, these missing bodies and whatnot, are people of color versus people of Caucasian backgrounds. I don't think that there's an equal or, or, or a, a fair amount uh, of people being subjected to these. What problems. would be your message to the person that is harvesting organs that may be looking at this right now? What is your message to Well, them? first of all, if they're black and they're helping people to, uh, to, to if, they're, if, they're, if they're of color, and they're out here helping uh, people outside of our particular social ethnic group and whatnot to, to capture us and murder us and whatnot for profit. They do these things for profit. They say that it's the new dope game. They, you can sell an organ. A person's liver or kidney and whatnot is worth thousands of thousands of dollars on the black market. And I would imagine that they got some stooges. They got some Uncle Tom Negroes running around here that might be helping these people Talk to capture mm -hmm. uh, those of us and use our body parts for their particular purpose and for their own financial good. And those particular per people, I think, really uh, are worthy of condemnation and uh, whatever subsequent uh, consequences they can, we can subject them to. And Ace, you know what, there's another thing, you know, with these young ladies that are coming up missing. I'm talking about in Chicago, but I know it's happening globally. All over the country. Okay. There are, there are 
people that are cannibals, okay? There are people that eat other people. I don't know if you're aware of this. There are black markets in Europe where you can buy body parts, where you can buy eyes, you can buy legs. And I did the research on this, brother. They have cookbooks for, for um, eyes, legs. What is your message to them, man? Because they're, they're, like I said, they're black markets. Well, I think we're talking about two totally different I'm subjects. talking about the women being abducted well, and being yeah, used Well, for you them. were talking about cannibalism. I'm talking also about organ harvesting where people are being captured and killed and, 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 and being uh, having their internal organs taken out and sold for profit on the black market. But I also believe that there's another uh, aspect of this, which is something about human sacrifices. And these human sacrifices, <laughs> these human sacrifices, are taking place for a, uh, any any number of reasons and whatnot. Some of them are supposedly spiritual or cultists. Talk about the Illuminati and all Well, that. I don't know if the, I, you know, I, I only speak about the things that I know. Okay. Uh, I, I don't guesstimate. It's, uh, I mean, sometimes I will if I'm in the company of people that it's okay to, to do that. But as a rule, I don't guesstimate as much as I like to rely on documented fact. And I know that they have these secret organizations that are into human sacrifice. They've always been there. Now, uh, the part about cannibalism, I, you know, when I, the, to me, Jeffrey Dahmer comes to mind. I think he's the face. Well, Hannibal, Hannibal, Hannibal Lecter, man. Well, Hannibal Lecter was a movie, <laughs> you know, know. But, the, but Jeffrey Dahmer and all of that bunch was, was, was real. So, um, and, and, and there are some people who have some real mental, mental issues and whatnot who resort to cannibalistic behavior and whatnot and just not knowing, uh, not being of a sound state of mind. So we're talking about a very, very yeah, broad, five minutes area, broad area here, mm -hmm. you know, very broad. Any comment on it, though? Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I'm opposed to it. I'm, I'm, I'm adamantly opposed to anybody uh, subjecting anybody to those particular types of measures for whatever sake, this. For, for whatever purpose. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, I'm looking at that. Uh, where is that from, by the way, uh, that particular? Brother, that's probably China. See, we need to know better. Brother, that, that, now, that could be corpses. Those are corpses. Is that a human corpse? That's, along that's, a, human, that's a human corpse. And brother. what is that lined up against the wall? So there? that's meat. That's what I thought. Those are animal corpses. Mm -hmm. And we know now that some countries, especially places in China, have been known to take those body parts of deceased persons and ground it up and mix it in with regular uh, consumer products mm -hmm. and with a consumer beef and meat. And what we know mm -hmm. now. But then again, didn't Burger King and all those, uh, didn't they find horse meat? has been, been documentally uh, found. Yes, alleged. No, no, <laughs> yeah. no, they found proof. Okay. And, and, and they admitted. I only speak about what I know. Okay. They found proof of uh, a lot of their uh, uh, so-called 100% ground beef products being mixed and blended in with horse meat, uh, which, which is probably not as offensive as human body parts, but we know that it has happened. Okay. Let me say something. Yes, you know, we got two, damn, two yes. minutes here. You're talking about modern-day slavery. Can yes. You can spend a minute on it. Well... First of all, um, sex that, slaves. Well, you, you're talking about specifically sex slaves? Women you being used for sex slaves once they abducted. Well, I, again, that's a whole nother area because, you know, inter, inter organ harvesting and then kidnapping and, and holding people hostage and whatnot to, to, for use as sex slaves, that's something that's been going on almost since the time immemorial. Okay, mm -hmm. that's been going on. Uh, but a lot of times a person Will, uh, will hire themselves out as an indentured servant or as a worker, or, or at least apply as a worker, or whatever, and then find out after the fact that this is, this is part of the job that they've signed on to, and that's when it becomes a matter of involuntary servitude or as a sex slave. Okay, you know what, I gotta tell the people how yes, so I'm gonna let them do.